Hey guys, welcome to Parkside at Home. I'm Lauren. And I'm Dally. And we are just so excited that you're joining us here on a special Sunday. It is Palm Sunday, so the week before Easter. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us if this is your first time. The best and the easiest way for us to get connected with you is by going to parkside.life slash connect. There you can fill out a quick connection card and one of us will be able to get in touch with you and answer any questions that you may have about Parkside. One of the things that we believe here at Parkside is that we are designed for community. There's a lot of different things the next couple weeks that you guys can get connected with in person as a community. And one of those things that we're super excited about is our annual Easter egg hunt. And now that's coming up on April 8th. And you know, we'll have thousands of eggs full of candy for kids and maybe for some adults too. Oh yes, absolutely. There will be some leftovers. <laughs> <laughs> the Easter egg hunt is gonna start at 10 a.m. Right Right down the street at the Sterling Athletic Field. We would love to have you. So if you want any more information or even to pre-register for the event, you can go to parkside.life slash Easter. We'd also love to see you that next Sunday yeah. for Easter Sunday here at Parkside. I mean, we just love to be able to come together and spend time together on a holiday as a family. One of those things that we'll get to be doing on Easter Sunday is a light brunch after service too, just to get to hang out as you know a family. Yeah, and like Lauren said, we, we say it all the time that if you are here, you are family. And we really, truly mean that. So we would love for you to come and join us and even invite some of your friends and family as well. Now, lastly, we have been kind of introducing yeah. this the last couple weeks, and that's our community groups. I know you've probably heard this and we're just, you know, keep doing it, but it's just, we're so excited about it. Mm -hmm. So one of those things that's starting on April 3rd is Open Gym. Open Gym is gonna be a great time for anybody who loves basketball, who wants to play basketball, pick up maybe even some, um, oh my gosh, what is that game called at the free throw line? Oh no. <laughs> Anyway, any type of fun basketball, this is your type of community event. And it's going to start on April 3rd, like Lauren said. And every other Monday is when this is going to be at 6 p.m. So come out, enjoy it, play some basketball, even some little competitiveness. It's going to be a really great time. And we just want to, you know, take a second and thank you guys for your generosity. I mean, it truly means the world to us each and every week to come here to serve our community and love on our Sterling Community Center. Um, you know, whether it be showing up as volunteers, whether it be giving financially, we are, again are just so thankful for all that you guys have done for us. If you would like to worship through giving, you can go to parkside.life slash give. This is a safe and secure way for you to partner with God in helping us build bridges between people and Jesus. Thank you guys again for joining us on Palm Sunday. We're excited to see you next week. Good morning, church. We start a new series today as we prepare for Easter Sunday next week, and Deborah and I have been talking a little bit about the specifics of this, and where we felt like God was leading us was this concept of the gospel changes everything. The gospel changes everything. I mean, if you think about it, that is the hope of what we celebrate for Easter. That's, that's the hope of the Easter season. It's the celebration of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The, the moment that death was defeated, the gospel changes everything. The moment that made it possible for each of us to have a relationship with Jesus, but not just have a relationship with Jesus now, but have the chance to spend eternity with Jesus Christ. Whole. Whole. The gospel changes everything. You know, humanity has been in need of change since we pretty much came into existence. I mean, going all the way back to the fall, we've been kind of separated from God because of sin. We've been in desperate need of change. And the Easter story that we really start celebrating this week, we call this week starting today Passion Week, um, the week that, that signifies, and we dive into the story of what happened from Jesus, uh, happened with Jesus from the time that he entered into Jerusalem until his resurrection. <coughs> uh, we start celebrating that change today, the change that we needed, but it wasn't necessarily the change that we wanted. That's where I want to focus our attention today. That's what I want to talk about. And it, it's easy to get 
wrapped up in the celebration of Easter, and we should. It's kind of a big deal for us in the church, right? It's kind of a big deal for the believers in the history of the world. But I think there's this other side that we need to take a look at before we celebrate together next week. To dive into the idea of what happens when the change that we want isn't necessarily the change that we need. I mentioned earlier that today is Palm Sunday, and all over the world, maybe, I don't, I don't know about other uh, cultures, but I know all over our world in America, there are little children dressed in their Sunday's best, waving palm branches all around the place. Like, at the church that I grew up, I remember, like, we would do that in the main service. Like, we would come down the aisle and, <coughs> and wave palm branches back and forth. And I remember being a kid, like, this is weird. I have no clue why we're doing this. But it was fun, and we did it. And we got to take the palm branches home, and, and to our parents, like, they loved it, right? Because every parent wants to come home with more stuff, especially stuff that you know is just going to go in the garbage. But that's what we did. It's happening all over the country today. And we celebrate that as the moment where Jesus comes into Jerusalem, what we call the triumphant entry, where he's just celebrated and lauded. And it, it's the height of his popularity after three years of going around, performing miracles, uh, telling people about himself, telling people about, about this new covenant that was coming And we see it in John chapter 12 when it says, um, starting with verse 12, the next day the the great crowd that had come for the festival, the Passover, heard that Jesus... (coughs) I'm sorry, guys. I promise I'm getting better. Um, He was on his way to Jerusalem. They took up palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Make a note of that. That's important. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it and is risen. Don't be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. Now, I remember growing up hearing the story and like celebrating it on this Sunday, right? Palm Sunday. And like it was this moment where Jesus was coming into Jerusalem for the Passover feast, celebrating with all his friends and family. The disciples were there. He gets into town. Everybody finds out he's coming. And so they, they all go down to the street that he's coming into and, and wave palm branches. They put their cloaks on the ground, like signifying like, almost like the red carpet being laid out for Jesus. And everyone in the city, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel. And like, we're taught growing up that this moment was like, this was about Jesus. This was about recognition of him being the Messiah. But there's some interesting things to unpack in this moment. Jesus rides in on a donkey, and the streets are flooded with people shouting his praise. There was this sense of anticipation that was building, that had been building for a while, really since Jesus started his his ministry, but there was something about him coming into town, riding on a donkey, that turned that anticipation into expectation. If you've heard this story before, maybe you heard that part of the expectation was they expected Jesus to come into town like a conquering hero. They were under another oppressive regime, the Roman Empire. The Jews had continued to be like kind of cast aside as lesser uh, members of society. And here it is, Jesus was coming in like a conquering hero. In their mind, Jesus was bringing change, the change that they had longed for for so long. And I've thought to myself, like, what was it about that moment that that created not just the anticipation, but the expectation of what they thought Jesus was going to do, the the change that they wanted so bad? Why was the city so excited at the sight of Jesus on the back of a donkey riding into the city of Jerusalem? Because they had seen this scene before. Before. They had seen this exact thing play out in front of their eyes before as a people. <coughs> if we were to turn back to the Old Testament to 1 Kings chapter 1, we'll find King David nearly on his deathbed. In fact, he was so feeble and frail, he could not keep himself warm, and they employed <laughs> a young girl from the city just to come and lay with him to keep him warm. 
And I find it hilarious that they made it a note to, in the Bible to point out that he did not have relations with her. That's one of the questions I'm going to ask the Lord when I get there. It's like, why, did, why is that a point to put in there? Like, what's, what's the significance of that? And also, it's really weird to me that, like, he was so powerful that, they, like, the only way they could keep him warm was to find some young girl and say, here, your job is to keep this old man warm. The Bible's weird, you know? <clears throat> but as... <coughs> I'm going to make a super cut of all the times that I cough over the last month. Um, but as David is nearing the end of his life, uh, he had already named his successor in Solomon. He had said publicly and privately, like, this is God's man to take over my responsibilities when I'm gone. But David had other sons who had other plans. And there was one son in particular, his name was, ready? I, I, I practiced it last night, and now for the life of me, I can't remember it. Adonijah. Adonijah, that's it. Adonijah. His son, Adonijah, started forming these secret plans with different leaders in the community to take over as king. He didn't feel like Solomon was worthy or he was jealous. I don't know why, but he said, you know what? We're not going to go that route. I'm going to have these secret meetings in town, and I'm going to become the king as soon as my father dies. Well, Solomon's, uh, <clears throat> Solomon's people and his mother and, and all these people went to David and said, do you not understand what's going on right in front of your face in your kingdom? And David realizes what's going on and steps in and says, before I pass, I'm going to have Solomon, my son, anointed as king. So he sent him out of town, had him anointed, and then put him on his mule and rode him into, into the city that would become Jerusalem on the same road that Jesus took. For them, in that moment, this was the public coronation of Solomon. This was to let everyone know in every arena that this is God's man to take over for David, to, to establish this new kingdom that was supposed to be for God. It ended up being that way. We had some issues with Solomon's life later on. But in this moment, this was his public coronation, not, not just in a practical sense, but in a spiritual sense. This was God's man for the job, and change was coming. That there was no, going to be no false king in his brother. Solomon was God's man. He had been crowned the new king, the right king. Things were getting ready to change. So then fast forward however many years later, and Jesus rides into town on the back of a donkey, the same exact roads, the, the same exact path, right? For the Jewish people at the time, they all knew that story. They all knew that story. It, that's what they grew up. Like, that's what they grew up hearing in their little Sunday school classes, whatever that looked like for them. They heard these stories. This was very familiar. It was a visual thing that they could see. It's like, oh, wait, this makes sense. Remember when Solomon did this and everything changed? Now this is going to change. A new kingdom is being established. We are not going to be under the oppressive rule of the Roman Empire anymore. This is what created that anticipation and expectation. Everyone knew that Solomon being crowned instead of a false king meant change. Everyone had been waiting on a Messiah, and that meant change. Everyone had heard the rumors about Jesus. The change has come. This was it. This was the moment. Everything was getting ready to change. And they were absolutely, positively right. Almost. As I've considered these parallels, a Palm Sunday thought has kind of invaded my thinking over the last couple of weeks, especially the last several days. The gospel changes everything, but sometimes the change we need isn't the change we want. People are waving branches or shouting praise to, to Jesus because they expected a certain type of change. They expected governmental leadership to change. That's what they wanted. But the change that Jesus was really bringing was the change they actually needed. Heavenly citizenship. 
He, the change he was bringing was not just for the moment. It was not for the next season. It was for eternity. <coughs> and I think on some level, we've all experienced what the people of Jerusalem at the time, or even regionally, went through. We anticipate or expect for God to bring change in our life, in our circumstances, in what's going on, and how we feel in the regime that seems to be resu- ruling the day. But when that change shows up, it's different than what we thought it would be. And the reality of unmet expectations, even if they're misplaced expectations, is disappointment. Even when God is doing the thing that we actually need, we feel disappointment because we're not getting what we wanted. And let me just take a quick pause real quick. Let me be very clear about something. Sometimes when we talk about not getting what we want, we tend to go into brat mode. Like, when we don't get what we want and we pout about it, we're being a brat. That's not what I'm saying here. I think God completely understands the desires of our heart, and he, and he wants to give us the desires of our hearts that line up with, with his will for our life. So I think it's okay to feel disappointment when things don't necessarily line up the way that we wanted them to. We're not being a brat because I don't think the Jewish people were, were wrong for wanting the oppressive government that was, that was ruling the day and beating them down to change. God's way was just better, even if it took longer. So the question of the day becomes what happens or how should we respond when the change we need isn't necessarily the change we want? I've been thinking about that question a lot, and I feel like I've arrived to a place where I felt comfortable sharing this in front of you guys, but I'm going to be honest with you, I'm still in process on this one. I don't think this is an easy conversation to parse out mentally, spiritually, even emotionally. But we're here in the Easter season, and it's incredibly easy to think about and talk about and share the warm, fuzzy parts of the gospel. We're talking about Jesus' death and resurrection, and why he did it was so that we could have a chance to have full life in him. <coughs> he, he defeated death for you. He came to give you life to the full because he loves you. He wants good things for you. His death brings freedom. His grace is enough. Those are the warm, fuzzy parts of the gospel, and they are absolutely 100% gospel truth. I don't want to minimize those things, but I think there's a side of the gospel that isn't Easter pastels and marshmallow peeps. I think there's a side of the gospel that that is a little bit more difficult for us to process and parse out and dissect. The resurrection of Jesus is the most hopeful and inspiring moment in human history. Death was defeated. We, have a, we now have a clear pathway back to God for now and eternity. But just 72 hours before, it appeared that all hope was lost. I think sometimes we have the blessing of being able to see like the story in its totality all at once. We didn't have to live through it. Um, But sometimes I think we miss some things that are really important when we see everything all at once. Can you imagine what the disciples were going through in those 72 hours between the moment that he passed or even before that, like when he was arrested and when he was resurrected? That was a really difficult time. I mean, think about it from your, if you're in that, sh- that, that spot, <coughs> you went all in on Jesus. You had followed him around for the better part of three years. You had given up time with your family. You had sacrificed your livelihood for the uncertainty of like, you know, you know him performing miracles, like to make sure you had enough food, right? Fish and, and, and bread. You had put it all on the line and you had seen things that were crazy, that you could not explain. The only way you could explain it is like, this is the Messiah. This is the one that you've been waiting for. And then at the height of his popularity, when things had started to turn, there were more people that were, that were also in on Jesus than ever before. You come into the city to celebrate Passover, and you see this anticipation and expectation that your history had created, right? And then here you are, a few days later, and people very quickly begin to turn against Jesus. One of, the, one of your brothers that you had been traveling around with for so long would sell him out 
for a little bit of money. Just hours later, he was to be executed publicly in one of the most humiliating, painful ways that a person can die. And he's dead and buried. Just in a matter of days, like you're, at the, you're just at a fever pitch. Finally, these things that we've been working towards, like people besides us are believing that he is who he says he is, all the way to he's in the ground. And we like to like venerate or you know, put into sainthood the disciples, and we should. They did amazing things, but they were still people. And I, I can't, I, I would let those guys off the hook if in that moment when Jesus is in the ground, when they woke up that next morning, and you know how like when something bad happens, you wake up the next morning, you have to remember it, and it's like it started all over again? If in that moment they thought, was this all for nothing? Was this real? Have I been duped? Did, did I make a mistake? I think it's completely logical and understandable that they would think that way. I imagine they felt utterly hopeless. Utterly hopeless. In seven days' time, or six days' time, however you want to look at it, like we're, we're going to celebrate Resurrection Sunday. But some of us are sitting here right now utterly hopeless. I mean, you guys know me well enough by now, like I, I'm a positive person by nature. I, I like to have fun. I like to have fun at other people's expense. The Lord's working me on that. My wife would very much appreciate your prayers. Yesterday was April Fool's. It's one of my favorite days of the year. But I'm not so naive or blinded to know that some of us may be feeling utterly hopeless. And sometimes I like to mask my own seasons of feeling hopelessness behind my positivity. The sun is shining, the birds are chirping, we're all suffering from allergies because of the pollen. Like the seasons have changed, like we should be in a great place, but we're stuck in the drudge and the dreary of whatever's going on in our lives. The anticipation of the truth of the gospel changes of everything for some reason did not meet our expectations, and we're living in the disappointment of that. The change that the gospel brought just seemed to lead us down a long and dark road. The goodness, that, that we, the goodness of God that we were desperate for only feels like defeat. Think about that. We were singing about the goodness of God this morning. Like, what happens if the goodness of God doesn't feel very good in the moment? The last thing we want to hear in these moments is about how good God is. Here's what I would say to you in this moment. It's not incredibly profound. It is very simple, but it is not trite. It is very important. Don't give up. That, that's it. I mean, like, that's, that's <laughs> the extent of my profound thoughts this morning. Don't give up. Resurrection is coming. I don't know when, I don't know how, but I believe with all my heart that resurrection is coming. <coughs> it's really easy for me to say in this moment, and it almost sounds cliche, and I hate sounding cliche in this moment. But don't check out. Let's dive in together, right? Because as cliche as it sounds, like, Sometimes what we need is just to tell ourselves to lean into the truth of just not giving up. I think disciples had to fight the same thinking. And I think some, to some degree, I, don't, I know to some degree, Jesus had to fight some of those thinkings as well. He, he had to lean into the idea of not giving up. I think a couple of things helped Jesus walk through that darkness. I think the first thing is, and if you're taking notes, write this down. Jesus leaned into his people. Jesus leaned hard into his people. If you go back and look at the, the, the weeks and especially the days before he arrived in Jerusalem and then the, the week before his arrest, like Jesus spent an incredible amount of time with his people. 
right before he went to Jerusalem, uh, Lazarus, the guy he had raised from the dead earlier on, hosted a dinner, right, where they got together and just hung out. It wasn't this big crowd of people. It wasn't a teaching moment. They just were having dinner together. And, and it has this really sweet moment where Mary anoints Jesus. Uh, side note, you just got mad and said, what, what, we could have used that for something else and blah, 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 blah. And I'm mad at Judas right now. Like, this is the time of year I'm really mad at Judas. But this beautiful moment where Lazarus was hosting this dinner in Jesus' honor. Mary, uh, you know, anoints Jesus with this really expensive perfume to honor him. And then when he gets into Jerusalem, we see over a few days of the Last Supper when, when Jesus washed the disciples' feet that we've talked about a lot over the last several weeks. This was a moment where, where Jesus kind of bears his soul to his people and, and humbles himself to the lowest place, the lowest station, and says, I'm going to take care of you guys. He leaned into his people. This is something that Jesus understood throughout his entire ministry. He understood the value of community. He understood that we are better together. Even Jesus, right? Jesus. You know this guy we're talking about? Like Savior of the world, Prince of Peace, like one who sits on the throne and intercedes on behalf of you at this very moment, like fully God, fully man. That guy needed community. I think he understood this because he understood the enemy. The enemy in the Bible is compared to a predator, a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. The go-to move for every predator is to isolate its prey. Every predator, right? When they go to get their prey, they look for the one that they can isolate from the group, get by themselves, and attack. And hear this with all the love that I have that's behind this. If you aren't leaning into community, you are easy prey. That's, that's not me saying you're weak, that, that, that you're invaluable, that you can't handle. Don't hear that. Don't let the enemy twist that. We're made to live in community. And sometimes we need to let the herd protect us. In fact, after service, we have new t-shirts where it says, I'm part of the herd. Just kidding. We will never do that. Now I kind of want to. <laughs> when we're in the struggle, we have to let the herd protect us. That means we have to open up, be honest, and be vulnerable. And I know this is hard. I struggle mightily with being open and vulnerable with people. Now I want to make an important distinction here. Leaning into community is not the same thing as being in community. That there is a little bit different thing. Like being in community, like we can just go have dinner and we can be in community. Or we can <coughs> stand around and have coffee and be in community. Leaning into community is something a little bit different, a something a little bit more vulnerable. Have, uh, hanging out, having a good time together, it's important. And it's what we do to build trust so we can lean into one another when our world, we feel like our world is falling apart. But sometimes I don't need someone to play pickleball with. Sometimes I need someone to bear my soul to. That's the distinction. That's the difference. That's what Jesus did. Like Jesus' disciples, they had a good time. They hung out all the time. They laughed and cut up. And, and I'm sure that, you know, like he laughed at Peter making fun of John. And, you know, when, when Timothy tripped and fell, like I'm sure, you know, they all had a chuckle at it. Like they were boys, right? They, they hung out all the time. But even Jesus leaned into his disciples uh, when they were together. We have to learn into, to lean into one another in those seasons when we feel like things are falling apart, when our expectations of what the change that brought, was brought to our life doesn't mean our expectations. But what about those seasons when we're on that long, dark road, when we have to be on that road by ourselves? Now, this is a really interesting notion because it, it seems to go against a lot of the things that we say. Like, we talk about how we're better together and, and like, no one goes through life alone. We got to do life together. But there's a reality that sometimes we can be with people and they can even help carry the load of what's going on, but there's a measure of what we're going through that we go through by ourselves. I recently sat down with someone who experienced um, or is going through a cancer diagnosis. 
And we sat together, and we prayed together, we shed a few tears together as we kind of reminisced about our own journeys and things we got going on and the uncertainty of the future. And he's got family that loves him, that love the Lord. And he's got all the support that you think that a person would need going through that. But there's going to come a point where he's sitting in a chair going through treatment by himself. Like even if his wife's sitting next to him, like she doesn't have a needle in her arm. You know, Deborah and I have experienced the loss of her dad. Or, or, you know, it's, it's coming up on a year and we're kind of anticipating what that means. And I've been right by my wife's side, but there's a measure of grief that she has to go through alone because I can't understand the fullness of her relationship with her dad because he wasn't my dad. I could be there right beside her. You you see what I'm saying? The point that I'm getting is sometimes we walk the long, dark road by ourselves, even with other people. What happens in those seasons? Like, how do we walk that path of difficulty in those seasons of life when it's time to walk that path on our own? You can have people with you, but they can't do it for you. That kind of thing. Here's my challenge to you, and hopefully my encouragement to you, if you're in that season. Endure. Endure. This is a concept in our world that seems to be fading. Everything in our culture looks at you and says, when you go through hard things, it's okay to give in. It's okay to give up. It should be easier than this. There has to be an easier way. It's not supposed to be this hard. Over my years in ministry, I can't tell you how many times I've heard some version of that statement. It's it's not supposed to be this hard. I wish I could tell you, like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's not supposed to be this hard. And sometimes I can look at you and say, it's not supposed to be this hard, but it is. And we have to live in the reality of what is and not lament what should be. For some of you, you shouldn't have to deal with the mess you have to deal with at work or at home. You shouldn't have to, but you are. So how do we deal with it? We endure. We endure. Hard truth, hard reality still exists in this world. And one of those truths is sometimes the only way through or I'm sorry, the only way to is through. For so many of us in our life, and I, look, I am the chief of this. If I can take a, a step to the left or to the right and avoid the pain and go around it, even if it takes a little longer, I'm going to do that. But sometimes pain and difficulty will move with us as we step to the left and to the right. Sometimes the only way to get to the thing that we are hoping for, that breakthrough that we want, is to grit our teeth, endure the pain, and go through the difficulty. We see this in a a beautifully difficult illustration in Matthew chapter 26, when we look at Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, right before he's arrested. This is one of the last, like, quiet prayer moments he has before... (coughs) He's arrested and tried and tortured and the crucified. Um, and one of, the, probably for me, one of the most difficult passages of Scripture for me to like really think through. When Jesus says, uh, he went away a second time and he says to the Father, My Father, if it's not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. The reason this is a difficult passage for me is because the struggle that I had was it appeared as if it was a crack in who Jesus was for a moment. Now, the reason that appeared to be a crack for me was I was uh, immature in every sense of the word. Now I understand that this is not a crack in his, uh, his deity, but it was a moment where his humanity was on display. And if you knew that you had to go through something incredibly difficult— like death, the, the fear of death, pain, torture, would you not say, hey, if there's any way I could get out of this, I'd like to take that? Of course we would. Of course we would. But Jesus made a decision. He made a decision that he was going to go through whatever came next because it had to be done to get to the other side. Resurrection is not possible apart from death. 
Sometimes we want to experience the the glory and, and the peace of resurrection, but we don't want to deal with the death part. Sometimes you can't experience the best this life has to offer apart from some of the difficulty. The victory that you're longing for, it can't happen apart from the battle that you're currently facing. You can't avoid it. you got to go through it. And you have to make a choice if you're going to face whatever comes next because it may be, it probably is the only way to get to the other side. In John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus tells the disciples and he tells us that in this world we will have troubles. Not we may have troubles. You might have troubles. This is how to avoid troubles. You will have troubles. And if you have not experienced trouble in this life so far, I would like to meet you so you can give me some lottery numbers and I could just fix a lot of my troubles. That's not true because we've all faced troubles. Carter is however many months old and he's faced troubles. But what if those troubles, your season of difficulty has purpose? James chapter 1, verse 2 starts with, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whatever, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces what? Perseverance, also known as endurance. Let perseverance finish its work. There's purpose to it. You're not just going through difficulty to go through difficulty. It has purpose so that you may be mature and complete and lacking anything. Not lacking anything. How many of you would love to say, I am mature, I am complete, and I'm not lacking anything? I am at the front of that line. But what are the only way to become mature, complete, and not lacking anything is let perseverance, endurance, finish its work. Hope can be found in the darkness and despair of the season you're in. I believe it. I've seen it in my own life. Resurrection is on its way. (coughs) It might be three days. It might be three months. It might be three years. I, I don't know. I can't tell you. But I can tell you it's coming. And I can tell you have everything that you need to endure this season, but it starts with making up your mind that you can endure. It's a mindset. Jesus made up his mind like, Lord, if I could avoid this, I would. But if this is the only way, I'm down 100%. I'll go through it. That's a mindset. There was no spiritual manifestation. It wasn't a miraculous work that somehow made him endure, right? He made the choice. So many times we're looking at our circumstances like, Lord, take it away or make it better. Resolve the situation. Hey, look, pray those prayers. Don't stop praying those prayers. But along with those prayers is a mindset like, Lord, whatever, however long I'm here, I can do this because if you are not going to put something on me that you and I can't handle together. Don't fall into the trap that if the Lord's going to put it on me, I can handle it all by myself. That is not a promise that's in Scripture. But the two of you together can endure. But you've got to make up your mind that you're willing. Maybe you showed up this morning and you're sitting there, you're like, this is not what I want to hear today. This is not why I got up out of bed and came to church. Maybe it's not what you wanted to hear, but maybe it's what you need to hear. Maybe the change that has come about in your life because you're following Jesus, it is not what you wanted, but it is what you needed. And I'm telling you, you can endure this season that you're in. You can get through it. One of the things that helps me is I try to think about what's on the other side. I try to think about that resurrection that's coming. The other side of this immensely painful and dark reality that, that even, like I think about even what Jesus went through in the torture and his death, but the beauty of his resurrection and what it means for me, what it means for you. Jesus is still in the resurrection business. He didn't stop with his own. Like that, that is his thing. 
He resurrects things that were once dead and now are made alive. He can bring hope in the most desperate of seasons. But don't give up. Lean into those who love you most. Make up your mind that you will see it through no matter how long it takes, no matter what you've got to go through. And really believe in the power that the gospel has to bring change that you need into your life. I'd love to pray with you. Lord, I thank you so much for the gospel and the change that it brings in our life. Thank you that you know better than we do what we actually need. And Lord, maybe the thing that we should be praying for in this moment that our understanding of of what we need and your understanding of what we need will come into alignment. Not that we'll meet in the middle, that we, we will meet you where you are. You meet us where we are as far as like our sin and, and our, the, our circumstances, our doubt and our struggle. But over time, our understanding of, of, of who we are, our identity, the things that we need, need to start shifting more to your understanding. Because that's where the best possible life is. That's where a gospel-centered life is. A full life is. A life that's growing in our discipleship with you and that's making other disciples. So as we leave here today in just a moment, Lord, I pray that the truth that's your gospel, the good news, the euangelion, it changes everything. Even when we don't understand everything about it, When the anticipation and the expectation, they start to fall short and create disappointment, we can still trust in you because resurrection is coming. In your name we pray. Our hope is that you are challenged and inspired by Matt's message today. It'd be really easy to just close out the video and go about your day. But I would challenge you just to take a moment and ask yourself how God wants to use you. In what ways is he you know, showing you how to live in love like Jesus and build bridges in your community? Thanks again for joining us. We'll hope to see you next week.